Welcome to episode 256 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. A short, uh, wait, this isn't a short episode where we catch up. We're going we're gonna to do some of that. We're going to do some of that. And uh, we're going to talk about the night sky because we are amateurs, astronomers. I love looking up at the night sky and going out under the stars. So Shane, we were we were chatting here and uh, and uh, we, were, we were talking about astronomy. We thought we might as well record an episode. And uh, I was telling you, uh, that I appreciate the work that you had done to put together those Borg 50 um, acromats during the pandemic because I was out using mine the, the other night and uh, how spectacular the views are through the Borg 50, um, especially on a windy night when no other the telescope could be mounted up. So th- thanks again for that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, they're, they're a wonderful little telescope. Um, perfect for that kind of night, you know, when it's windy and the bigger telescopes really don't operate all that well in those conditions. Yeah, they're, the, they're awesome. In fact, you know, I haven't used my little fifties in a while, but maybe I should pull them back out because they are fun. Yeah, I, I keep it right here. And that was a night I wasn't going to observe. Uh, it was cloudy and, and it was really windy. And then the clouds totally cleared up. It was a spectacularly clear night. Um, and, uh, yeah, put the, put the Borg 50 up. And then as well, you had repaired my tripod, um, way back in the early spring. And I was also singing your praises because, uh, when I reached down to grab the handle, it actually worked and wasn't just all a gnarled mess like it was before, uh, <laughs> before you did the fix. So thanks again for that. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. I'm glad it's working out. Yeah, I know it's, uh, it's working out uh, pretty good. You know, the, the one thing I was going to mention there, and I said, oh, we should just record this, was that uh, last night I spent some time with my old, I forget what they are, they're sitting over here, but they're the the old Sears uh, mm-hmm. 7 by 35 uh, crazy wide field 13 degree um, binoculars. Mm-hmm. That was my mm-hmm. first night. I finally had pulled them out and you've bought some of these vintage binoculars as well. And I, I don't know what your impression uh, of them has been or, or, or if you did ever get a good pair or not. Well, yeah, I've played around a little bit with them. Um, I'm trying to think Martin pond, I think on cloudy nights, <clears throat> I think he's one of the uh, more experienced uh, observers with these older binoculars and he posts a lot of his findings and what, you know, which ones he likes the most. And my issue with a lot of these old seven by 35 ultra wide fields is like the edge correction is awful. You know, once you get to maybe just past halfway from the center, you know, there's a lot of distortion. Um, but there's a couple of brands out there. Like there's a Sears brand. I think that's the one you have that is uh, kind of renowned for way better correction than most. Of yeah. The other just ones. grab mine here. Yeah. Let me, uh, cause these ones are awesome. People are looking to get a pair. You pay a little bit. Well, mine, sorry, mine aren't the Sears, but they are. Um, Mine end up being the Cardinal, um, but they're identical to the Sears. They're exactly the same. And they're a super wide angle. They say they're fully amber coated optics, but my optics don't look amber coated. And they are 7 by 35, 657 feet at 1,000 yards. They've got a magnesium body and they've got a number here. I don't know what it is. CP-01668. Uh, CP-01668. They've got a one of those weird tripod threaded mounts on the right um, barrel, not on the um, hinge. Mm. They are awesome. These are really, really good. They just look like an old crappy pair of binoculars, though. <laughs> they do not look like anything special at all. I think I paid a pretty penny for them because they are in very good body condition. The outer lenses are, well, the lenses are all in great condition. Perfect. They're all perfect, except that, I don't know what you call them. No, they're not the dew caps, but the little retaining rings that kind of are on the end. I don't know why, but they're kind of dinged and scuffed, but the they're, they're in almost perfect alignment. And uh, I was comparing them to my seven by 35 Nikons and uh, they're close. Like they, they drop off the field of the, the field at the edges is, is uh, a bit distorted, but I think it's actually because of my astigmatism. I take my glasses off when I use them. And so I can't tell you whether or not it's uh, the optics in these or whether it's just, just my eye or a combination of both. But uh these are really awesome binoculars. If you can find a pair, I think I ended up paying 
about 180 bucks Canadian for these. And if you saw these old crappy seven by 35 binoculars and heard that I paid 180 bucks for them, you'd think that I'd really lost it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the pair that I, um, I've got a couple, like I've got a town and country pair, um, town Ooh, and, co- town yeah. and country. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Drive around your limo looking through those Shane. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there was a couple that were basically rebadged. I forget all of the models, but town and country was one of them. Uh, this yeah. was uh, one of the pair recommended by, um, Martin pond and they're okay. Um, the others that are, you know, fairly well renowned are the Bushnell range masters. Oh yeah. Those was really good. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up finding a pair of those and there's a couple versions of these, like there's a sort of traditional looking binocular mm-hmm. and then another one that's sort of referred to as like a bat wing and they look a little different. Uh, I've got the bat wing version. They're 11 degrees. Um, they're okay too. Um, I just don't think that my eye corrects very well for, um, field curvature. And, you know, Mm. that's, uh, like, I think your eyes are way better at it than mine are. And, uh, I just find these ones again, just too distorted for me. Plus Mm. all of these ultra wide fields, there's just very little eye relief, particularly for somebody needing to wear glasses. Oh yeah. So as a result, I really should sell these because they are quite desirable and I know somebody out there in the world would definitely use these and appreciate these way more than me. So I should probably part with them at some point. Yeah. I, I don't know. I always wanted a, a pair of the super, super wides like these, I guess these have like a 13 degree field. And, and, and if I, I have to take my glasses off, but it's almost like looking through two little naglers, right? <laughs> like when you're mm-hmm. looking through them and the field of view is just massive. Um, like it's extremely immersive. It's kind of strange in a way that, uh, that nobody's making them like this today. Um, considering there's lots of folks that don't wear, uh, glasses when they, when they do astronomy, even if they wear glasses otherwise. And, and honestly, to, to, to my eye, um, it almost makes me want to get contacts almost, I'm not going to get contacts, but it almost makes me want to get contact lenses um, in order to, to really, really enjoy these because wow, like compared to the, the newer, much newer Nikons, they give up almost nothing in light transmission. And uh, like I said, the field of view is just wildly immersive. Like it, it really is a Nagler like uh, view through them. Um, and, and it's such a huge view. Like I could easily fit the teaspoon of um uh, of sagittarius in in the whole field of view i can barely get it in my nikons um and it's right at the edge but with this it's like framed inside the field of view and uh and i can get the the whole bowl of the the big dipper in these as well so that's that's a big field of view for a seven by 35 so it's not like a it's almost like a constellation it's it's really close to like those constellation view binoculars that, uh, that we made, but, uh, but at, at seven by 35 power is, uh, it's a lot of fun to use. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, uh, they're, they're neat binoculars and it's kind of interesting. You know, I'm more of the vintage telescope guy between the two of us. And I think you're mm. more of the vintage binocular guy between the yeah, two of us. You pairs, yeah. And, uh, the, the neat thing about that is, is to not sleep on these old optics. There's some really good stuff out there. Oh yeah. You do have to know a little bit of what to look for, but, um, they are pretty fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely recommend these. I forget what the, it's it's the Sears. It's like a 287 or something like that. Anyway, you look for the ones that are 657 feet at a thousand yards and it has to be that one. And it has to be one with the amber coated lenses, whatever that means. I can't really see the amber coating on these. It just looks like a mild yellowish coating. Uh, but the lenses are coated. That's That was almost a rarity in those days. And yeah, it's a lot of fun. Oh, I was going to say this, and that is that uh, you were saying that your eye doesn't adjust well for the, um, for the outer field or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. But you know, what I found with these, Shane, is that when I tried them in the city, um, I gave up and thought, I can't use these either. But when I, when I brought them out here this week and started messing around with them, I was like, oh, uh, it, it, it was somehow in the city. And even the first night I had them out here, um, I found it really difficult to focus them. And, and that because of that in the city, I don't know, you need to get like the eye dark adapted. 
Mm-hmm. And if the eye isn't dark adapted, when you look through these binoculars, at least for me, I can't nail the focus. And if the focus isn't nailed, it's just ridiculous looking through them. Like it's just a kaleidoscope. It's pointless. Um, oh. But from, from a dark sky, when you're sitting in the, in the reclining chair and you're relaxed and you mess around with them for like a while, like the first night I had them out, I, I didn't really do much profitable observing with them because I was just messing with the focus and I couldn't get it. And then last night it was windy and it got super windy. So again, I decided that I would just do binoculars after a while um, and uh, was able to get it dialed in finally. All right, now we're ready to go. So it took a while for me to get them dialed in. I just really wanted to see um, what it was like to, to look through them. There was another Sears pair. My mom had a pair. That's really what got me turned turn on to these is that I'd read about them and I had gone down to visit my, my folks uh, on the other side of the country at one point in time. And I didn't take anything with me for astronomy. It wasn't supposed to be good weather and uh, turned out that we had this, this really good night. And, uh, and I saw that mom had a pair of old Sears binoculars that somebody in her church who had like passed away or something had given her. And so they were like these really old Sears uh, binoculars that had an 11.8 degree field of view. And I was able to, to, to use those well. Um, and they were fine, but these, these ones that I got here, these Cardinal ones are, they're just absolutely spectacular. These ones with the, uh, 657, uh, foot view at a thousand yards. Anyway, anyway, can't recommend those enough, especially if people don't wear glasses for observing, you can find these things pretty cheap. And, uh, I still think like 180 bucks Canadian, is a steal for a seven by 35 binocular that works like you're, you're basically looking through a couple uh, uh, type one nagglers really is kind of what they're like. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, they're, they're very interesting and I will give these a try uh, under a dark sky. Cause I certainly have not. So I'll next time I come out, I'll bring the, these range yeah. masters and we can play with these things a little bit to see. Uh, well, I'm curious just to see how you like them. Um, and then I'm curious to see how my dark adapted eyes will do with them. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, or, or I hope you are. May, maybe you won't, but it's uh, it's worth uh, it's worth a shot. All right, so uh, yeah, we got a couple of listener emails here. Uh, we heard from lots of folks about uh, about the, uh, the the very short episode we did on the death of uh, of the great observer and common hunter Don uh, Mackles. So. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, everybody who uh, who wrote in. I I feel like we were pretty fortunate to uh, just connect with him and record a couple episodes only, uh, you know, uh, a few months before he uh, he he hit his untimely passing. So uh, it, it was really nice to get all those emails from people. Yeah, yeah, it certainly was. Um, it, it was pretty easy to understand his the impact that he had on many people and what I think set Dawn apart from you know, maybe some others is he just was such a personal person, you know, like Mm -hmm. the, the, a lot of the folks that wrote us, um, you know, about, uh, their relationship with Don talked Mm -hmm. about how like, you know, Don never really knew them, right. He like these folks that, you know, wrote us, wrote him, uh, and just, you know, created relationships very quickly over email and how Don would help them with information or guidance or, or even some motivation and support in ways. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty special person that does that. And uh, yeah, he'll be missed. And it was just nice to um, receive, I guess, kind of the emails of stories, you know, that people had about interacting. Yeah. With Don. He, he just was a great person. Yeah. And, I, and on the podcast front, it was, I always thought it was awesome that there, uh, you know, there, there's just not that many uh, people out there who are doing podcasts on visual observing because I think mm-hmm. it's a fairly small audience. There's no way to make money on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're right there for sure. So, so I always really like the fact, and there's and there's no competition because there's so few of us um, that do it. Um, you know that we do kind of all end up sort of running into each other one way or another, and and support each other as much as possible. And Dom was was a huge supporter of of doing this. And uh, he did it in his own way, and uh, I enjoyed it. I know you enjoyed it. I know a lot of uh, our listeners enjoyed the way that he did his podcast, which were um, man, it, it it and it was really cool to talk to him. Like we talked to him about how he constructed his uh, his podcast, which was very different. You know, he was doing visual astronomy too, but it was just Don talking, 
And man, he would really prep and write himself a script. Eh? Like he, he sort of detailed it out for us. And we were like, whoa, like he, he was really putting in a lot of time and, and mm-hmm. effort in, uh, in creating his podcast there. And I, and I, you know, we, we do some, some different things for sure. But, uh, you know, I really, really was, uh, was amazed at, at how he would prep to do one. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely put a lot into that and it came through, you know, when you listen to it, it was very polished and very well laid out. Um, yeah. I'll miss his podcast for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, uh, yeah, it's too bad. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and as well, just that, uh, you know, it, it's just unfortunate that there are so few of these uh, visual observing podcasts. One of the reasons why we started making one is, uh, is because there, there was so few. And I actually think we end up starting our podcast around the same time that Don starting his, but anyway, not getting into that. Um, had a voicemail from, from Phil. He was, uh, he sent us a voicemail. I ended up listening to it while I was observing. And he was, it was funny. He was talking about observing the, uh, the double cluster. And I was like, Oh, I'll observe the double cluster while he's talking about it. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed his uh, his message, and um, in particular, I was enjoying his uh, observations of Saturn. Um, mm. He was really seeing a lot of uh, detail there um, mm-hmm. within the rings and on the the disc itself. So Phil typically uses uh, an eight inch Newtonian, but he also has a, uh, a sixty millimeter Acromat, uh, an old Tasco Royal Astro, uh, which is a, a very fine performer. I know because I uh, I used to look through it. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, anyway, uh, it was just super cool to hear Phil talk about, um, the different views with different apertures. And, uh, I always enjoy those. Um, they're, 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 um, uh, like Phil's way of, of describing what he sees is, uh, is very unique and I love it. And, you know, I think Phil also has, a um, uh, like an ability to really see color. Well, you know, and Mm -hmm. color is, very different from you to me to anybody else. And it's just mostly how our eyes work. And uh, yeah, Phil, I think is uh, fortunate to have that ability to just pick up a lot of that color that is out there. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I'm just putting this in the notes uh, so you can see it, but Julian, um, who's an, he's a, he's an artist, he's a professional artist. Um, and one of our listeners, it seems like I know all these artists since I get into astronomy and I'm not really like that artistic, but it's, I, I, I find art is one of those things that I really enjoy. And I really enjoy like finding out how people um, create the art that they do and the process they go through. I just find the whole, the whole thing uh, super fascinating and, and have a lot of respect for people that, uh, that choose to do this because it, it's not an easy way to make a living. Um, anyway, uh, so Julian had sent me, I know I owe him an email he sent me an email um, asking if I'd take a look at some of his um, observing logs. He's working on the messies. And, uh, and we got into that because he sent me um, this, this really cool set of globular clusters that he's recently done. I think as, as recently as, uh, as this spring and early summer, he was uh, doing like, and and I'm going to say, I could be wrong here, but I believe it's like impressionistic um, versions of uh, some of the globulars like M15. I think there's a couple other ones in there. That's one that stood out to me. Um, and so, um, yeah, he kind of does some sketches in the field and then he sort of puts it through his, um, his lens, uh, his artistic lens and then, and then creates uh, some paintings, um, which was really cool. Did you see those or did he just send them to me? I, I couldn't remember whether he was writing me or whether he was writing both of us. I think I did see them. Yeah, no, they were really impressive. Yeah. So then he and I, you know, I kind of went down the rabbit hole a bit on some of that stuff with him, asking him like about his process and everything. Um, I found that super fascinating. Um, yeah. Some of the other people that, that we have around that are artists like Randall and Kathleen and Peter. And, uh, you know, I, I know I'm probably missing a few people there, but uh, yeah, I, I just find it really cool just, just to see how people uh, create this stuff. Um, but yeah, I owe him an email. I was going through, like he sent me I always feel like, like he's put a lot of work into his observations Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people send me stuff and I just want to give it the respect that it deserves to, to actually really sit down. So I sat down, I was going through them and there, he sent a lot of observations. Um, And so, yeah, I just need a little bit more time here. I think tomorrow I should get some time. So he'll, he'll probably hear back from me before this airs, but, uh, but yeah, if, if somebody does want me to, to look at stuff or, or you as well, Shane, I guess, if they want to send both of us, that's fine. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I, I, I do kind of give it the respect. I'm not just going to kind of whip through it and then kind of say it's good. I'm like, you know, I'm going to really churn through it. If somebody really wants me to look at, at what they're doing. And I'm also like super fascinated at, at how people do it um, and how people do their observations um, and where they're going with it. I, I have my own process that I go through and, uh, and yeah, it's interesting just, just to see how other people uh, approach it. So yeah. Anyway, uh, hey, look, Trevor sent us a really neat note on a new um, dark sky preserve here in Canada. Do you want me to read this? And then uh, there's one maybe you can read. Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right, so Trevor writes, uh, Hi, Chris and Shane, on September 4th, that is today, the official signing for the Spruce Woods Dark Sky Preserve will be taking place. The uh, RASC Winnipeg, that's the Royal Astronomical Society of, of Canada's Winnipeg Centre, and Spruce Woods Provincial Park and Manitoba Parks have been working for well over 10 years uh, to make this happen. Uh, Trevor says, my club, the Brandon Area Astronomical Society, has been a big part um, uh, with the, the Parks Astronomy Program there and will continue to do so. And he says that prior to uh, Brandon Astronomy Club starting up and going to Spruce Woods for weekend observing trips, um, the members of uh, Winnipeg Centre were, were joining in as well. Uh, and then this is where the, the idea of making the Spruce Woods, the Dark Sky Preserve, had uh, come to fruition. So uh, Spruce Woods is located 45 minutes east of Brandon, Manitoba, and Spruce Woods uh, is a really dark site. Uh, he put his sky quality reading at 21.5 to 21.7. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing it's pretty good. I've Rick uh, Huziak, who's a, who's a friend of ours, he goes down, he's been down there to the star party a few times, says it's a great site. And he says, I don't know if you've done an episode solely on dark sky preserves in Canada. That could be a good topic. And uh and then he sent a link. Uh, you can just Google Spruce Dash Woods LPA RESC, and it's uh, there, there's a website they've got up now. Uh, so thanks for that, uh, Trevor. Thanks for for that uh, that information on Spruce Woods. I actually went to the website and uh, and read through it, and uh, yeah, it looks really like a really great spot. I haven't been there before. There was there was a couple of years I thought I might duck over for the star party, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's not even that far for us. I think it's like a four hour drive for that one, Shane. Yeah, it's not too bad. And you know, that sky quality uh meter reading is outstanding. Like that is really, really good. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, my I heard interest a, is peaked. <laughs> yeah, I heard it's a neat spot too. I think there's like some sand dunes there and some interesting wildlife and trees. Seems seems like a like a really cool spot anyway to go to. So yeah, I got to try to make my way over there. Somebody else was asking if we were going to go over to the Alberta Star Party um, this autumn. That's happening at, I think it's the third week of of September. Um, yeah, I'm finding it tough to kind of go other places and do observing when um, I have my own dark sky sight now. <laughs> so, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a little bit, a little bit spoiled here. But I've always wanted to go to the Alberta Star Party, but. I looked at that. I think it was going to be like an eight-hour drive or something. Anyway, it's a long drive. So. Where where is that one? It's over at Starland Park, um, sort of in sort of central uh, Alberta. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a drive uh, for us to to get there. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so there's there's that. I heard from somebody who was going up to the. Um, I think it was Mary who's going up to the. Um, who, Mary's a listener. And and she's going up to the uh, Jasper Dark Sky Festival in October. I think it's the third weekend of October. So you you haven't been up to that one, I don't think either, have you? No, uh, there's a I think there's a forest fire burning near there right now. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So I I don't know if that'll impact their star party, but uh, something to keep a, a watch on. Yeah, I've been up to the Jasper Dark Sky Festival uh, a couple times. Anyway. Mm-hmm. And especially like, I think it was almost like the first year they were getting it running. So uh, they were just trying to get people to go. <laughs> so I went and they got David Levy to go. And, and uh, I ended up um, realizing that I should have a car when I get up there because I was talking to somebody on the bus. They they'd sent a bus to pick us up and there was like five or six of us on the bus. And uh, I was like, holy cow, if I get up there without a car, I can't go and do anything. And there's all kinds of stuff to do up in Jasper. So uh, I hopped off like in the middle of Edmonton and rented a car like somewhere and, uh, and then went up and then, cause I was the only one with a car, I ended up driving like 
you know, other folks around and, and, uh, and uh, doing, doing some touring around and went observing with Viva Levy one night, which is kind of, it was kind of fun. He, he had like a, like a set of like directions to a dark sky spot written on a napkin. And we went just sort of wandering around in the dark and got kind of lost. It was, it was a little bit sketchy, but uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, Jasper dark sky festival. Um, it's uh, the sort of, it's almost like the Disneyland of star festivals, I think. Um, where you can go up and there's all kinds of speakers and they've kind of like stations set up in the dark and there's speakers on some nights. And then there's these stations on a couple nights where you go around and people are given like naked eye sky tours. I did some of those for them once and uh, amateur astronomers from the Edmonton center of the RASC uh, go there. Um, Alistair Ling, who's, who's one of the uh, contributing editors to astronomy magazine He's usually there um, along with uh, a lot of other pretty experienced amateurs. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Pretty cool time. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then we had an uh, email here from, from Larry. Do you want to take a read of this one? Uh, yeah. So uh, Larry wrote, dear Chris and Shane, uh, I've been enjoying summer or I've been enjoying the summer shorts. Uh, nice to hear about some topics that wouldn't fill a full episode, but are interesting. Uh, really like the one on Burnham. Uh, maybe you should consider adopting a short dash long format when you shift back, uh, after summer, but then again, with all the planetary observing coming up over the next few months, you may not have time to switch back, <laughs> uh, over the past few months, I have picked up a new telescope, uh, a SV bony 80 millimeter F seven ED, uh, and then in brackets, like the Astrotech 80 ED. Uh, nice. and, and several new eyepieces, um, a Pentex XW, XW seven millimeter. Do you have that one, Chris? Yep. I have them all. Except yeah, the 30. Yeah. yeah. That one's Except awesome. the 30, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, he also got a used Vixen LVW 3.5. Uh, Those are used- nice. You had the Vixen LVWs for a while. Yeah. I had quite a few of them. Um, I don't, I did not have that one. I think my shortest focal length was five millimeter and they're a wonderful eyepiece. I uh, like those eyepieces a lot. They might've they might be the most comfortable eyepiece I've ever used. Like yeah. it just didn't matter where your eye was. There was no blackouts. Like it was just, they were so easy to use. Uh, most of them until you get into like the, uh, maybe above 30 millimeter, uh, they're inch and a quarter barrels, but they also have a two inch barrel. So like they fit in any diagonal They're just a, a well-designed eyepiece. Yeah. Ron Ravenberg is, who's a well-known, uh, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, a telescope builder, a telescope reconstructor. Anyway, he, uh, yeah, he, he had a, like a whole pile of, of those Vixen LVWs down at Starfest one year when I lived in Ontario, he'd come up and, and I spent a night, uh, hanging out with him, looking through some vintage telescopes and, and he had rebuilt like an Astro scan, which is oh, wow. like, uh, a similar telescope to my comic catcher. And uh, anyway, uh, really turned me on to those eyepieces. I couldn't believe how sharp like the 22 LVW was in an F four inch um, yep. uh, Newtonian. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I, uh, I regret selling them. I, um, I sold them when I acquired my Leica zoom and then I uh, in selling the LVWs that funded, I think my 120 ed skywatcher refractor but anyway mm-hmm. maybe one day i'll reacquire some of them uh larry goes on to say he also got a takahashi mc high ortho 2.8 millimeter uh which is a 0.965 inch eyepiece and all of the, you know people have heard me say this before but i i always have to chime in i think that those old tac uh mc orthos so mc stands for multi-coated um, are just outstanding. Uh, the whole line is really, really good. Um, they're just, in my opinion, probably the, one of the best bargains in astronomy. If you're looking for like a high contrast, super sharp eyepiece, uh, they're just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he goes on to say, uh, but of course the weather in my part of Japan has been terrible since spring. I've only gotten out a few times and at that, uh, just for very short ses- sessions, dodging clouds and jumping in sucker holes, mm-hmm. uh, last weekend, the skies finally cleared and I got out for a good three hour session. Uh, I called it a, a smorgasbord, uh, session because rather than spending a long time on a few objects, I jumped all over the sky, trying out the new scope and eyepieces on a variety of targets, uh, from the summer triangle to Saturn to Cassiopeia and Andromeda. And finally to Jupiter, I think I looked at about 20 different objects from doubles to nebula, to open clusters, uh, to M31, uh, getting my fill of observing. 
Uh, and then I uh, thought I would share some highlights. So he goes on to say, I began with Saturn. Uh, pretty sure I could see Cassini for the first time. Uh, overall, the planet had a whitish cast, uh, less cream color than I've previously observed. Uh, only the northern cloud band was visible, uh, which, you know, for me, Chris, that's pretty common. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you get a little bit more detail, but um, mm -hmm. that uh, that's a pretty good observation there. Um, then Larry says it was a paler shade of tan than before. Uh, Titan and Rhea were visible, making a nice fish hook with two field stars, um, like a, a trail of stars coming off the planet. Later, when I came back, I was able to pull out uh, Tetis as well with averted vision and best within the TAC MC Ortho 7 millimeter. Uh, next, I moved around in the area, uh, or I moved in the area around Sajida. Uh, first, I took a quick peek of the coat hanger, uh, then Theta Sagit or Sag Sagite? <laughs> Sagite? Sa Sagide, yeah, that's better. Uh, this is uh, an interesting triple, uh, not so colorful, but the surrounding area is really nice and the field looks a bit like a widely spaced open cluster. I will visit it again. Uh, moved on to M27 and M57. Uh, M27 was pretty much uh, a vague spot of fog, mm -hmm. uh, but still better than I had uh, been able to see before. Uh, the XW7 showed this one the best uh, with a nice balance between magnification and brightness. Uh, M57 was also best in the Pentex, uh, a little gray ball with straight vision, but a donut with averted vision. Nice. Uh, yeah, that is nice. Uh, I guess you can only get so much out of three inches of aperture from inside the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an M57 is one of those objects that is pretty good even in a light polluted sky. It does, uh, it, it just shows well. Yeah, I was looking at it the other night, uh, night before last. I had it uh, in my, say, using, I was using my 100 millimeter DC, I guess. Yeah. So I had oh. it in that under some decent power. Yeah, really, right really on. fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, later in the night, I observed the blinking planetary in Cygnus as well. Uh, first time to see it. Uh, it was a very vague gray circle, uh, tougher to see than either M27 or M57 with what seemed to be a bright dot in the center. Uh, it did seem to pop in and out of vision as I switched between straight and averted vision. I didn't want to fiddle around with my nebula filter to see if it would improve the view of uh, any of the nebula, but we'll try it out next time. Mm -hmm. Uh, followed this with some colorful doubles, uh, Gamma Delphinus, uh, nice yellow gold primary and blue green secondary, uh, Alberio, uh, 61 Cygnus, uh, which is a red orange primary and yellow orange secondary, uh, Omicron Cygnus, um, what is this one here? Orange, white, and pale blue green, uh, always reminds me of an Irish flag and <laughs> some clusters in Cygnus, M29, M39. Uh, my favorite of these was NGC 6910, uh, a small cluster just off a of Saturn. Uh, it looked like a tiny triangle linked by a winding chain of very faint stars, a subtle but beautiful cluster. Uh, kept going after this for a bit, but my notes uh, began to trail off, so I must have been getting tired. Yeah. Uh, anyway, hope you guys continue to have clear skies. Um, you know, Larry's written us a number of times. Yep. And what I love about Larry's observing is he does, uh, he does this all from a very light polluted area in Japan mm -hmm. and is able to still get a lot of really cool astronomy in. And, you know, Larry does do a lot of double star observing and, um, you know, those are always great in the city and, you know, as well as some of these open clusters and super cool that he even uh, was able to get in some nebula observing. Yeah. Very neat. Very neat. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, do you have anything else to uh, to add to to this episode? It was really great to hear from Larry and great to hear from everybody else. Yeah, no, nothing else to add. It, uh, I really enjoyed reading these reports. Yeah, cool. And we've certainly received a lot more emails than, than we're reading these days. So uh, we, we appreciate everything that everybody's uh, sending in to us. So thanks, Shane. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, we appreciate all the emails people send us. You can reach us at actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks much. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.